Good evening, everyone. I'm Margaret Andera, the Interim Chief Curator and Curator of Contemporary Art here at the Milwaukee Art Museum, and I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming you tonight to the Milwaukee Art Museum for this very special program with William Kentridge. The museum's 2018 presentation of the artist's remarkable eight-channel video installation, More Sweetly Play the Dance, is one of the most memorable exhibitions in recent years. And a testament, oh, yes, please. <laughs> and a testament to Kentridge's ability to cross genres, mediums, and engage with a variety of artists, voices, and perspectives as part of his artistic and dialogic process. We are honored to have the artist here tonight for his lecture, Finding the Less Good Idea. On behalf of the museum, I'd like to take just a moment to thank those people whose efforts have been instrumental in making this event possible. First, I'd like to thank everyone in the audience, both in person and online, for being with us tonight and for making time this election day to attend an act of civil engagement with art. Thank you to the staff at the Warehouse Art Museum for inviting the Milwaukee Art Museum to host this program. And we are particularly grateful to Danielle Passwaters, Avery Pelicudis, and Mia Dreher for all of their work in planning this event. Thank you to Bronwyn Lace and the rest of the Center for the Less Good Idea team for being such generous collaborators and for their continued commitment to centering process, experimentation, and dialogue. Thank you, Mr. Kentridge, for being here in Milwaukee and for so generously sharing your ideas with us. And finally, Thank you to John Shannon, who together with his wife, Jan Sayre, built the expansive collection of the artist's work that is featured in the William Kentridge See for Yourself exhibition. If you haven't yet had a chance to see the show at the warehouse, make sure you do so before it closes on December 16th. deserved. Oh. We also encourage you to see three plays produced by the Center for the Less Good Idea and on view at the Broadway Theater Center until November 10th. John and Jan, oh yes, please clap, clap for that as well. John and Jan are longtime friends and loyal supporters of the museum. And we are so pleased to be part of the tremendous slate of programs they've planned in celebration of the exhibition. And now, please join me in welcoming to the stage, Mr. John Shannon. Good evening and uh, Thank you for being here, you here in the hall and you online as well. Um, I would like to uh, thank sincerely the Milwaukee Art Museum for their hosting this event. They were generous, thoughtful, and I think you'll see uh, it's going to be a wonderful presentation. This is a special space. Margaret uh, mentioned uh, the Center for the Least Good Idea. Mr. Kentridge will be talking about it. I really encourage you to see the three plays which are currently at the Studio Theater, at, at the Skylight Theater. 
Uh, you'll find in your program a reference to those three plays. They were developed in uh, Johannesburg by the center. Uh, they are here for three days, six performances. There are three plays that are about 20 minutes each and they're, uh, they're consecutively um, played. So in uh, 50, uh, 75 minutes, you see all three plays. These plays, um, this group has never performed in the, in the United States before. So this is a special uh, event that they are here. The other thing is, uh, Mr. Kentridge told us yesterday that these plays have only been performed in Johannesburg. So in a sense, you have a world premiere in the uh, theater group. Please buy tickets. Um, it's a wonderful performance, surprising, inventive, and moving. The other event uh, that I'd like to bring to your attention takes place on Wednesday of next week. And that is when Present Music uh, performs here at the Milwaukee Art Museum in the Windover um, Auditorium. They will be uh, joined by Philip Miller, a South African compo music composer who has worked with William since 1994. They have produced countless projects together, and we invited Philip to join Present Music here for a special presentation that will include many films by Kentridge, projected on a big screen in the auditorium. Philip is bringing a couple of singers from South Africa, and they are powerful voices. And the other thing that's so special for us is that Elizabeth Kentridge is an artist and a poet. And Philip Miller composed a song cycle based on Elizabeth's poetry. That will have a world premiere here at the Milwaukee Art Museum next week, Wednesday. We're at a capacity audience here today. We will have a capacity audience for present music a week and a day from now. If you're interested, please get tickets early ahead. You don't want to be turned away at the door. We don't want that to happen. So talking about the Center for the Less Good idea is a segue to William Kentridge. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Warehouse Art Museum, Milwaukee Art Museum, John, Jan, and all of those who've made the, not just this evening, but the whole series of presentations in Milwaukee possible. The exhibition, the theater performances at the Skylight Broadway Theater, and the performance of, uh, the performance next week of Philip Miller's song cycle here in the beautiful space, in that beautiful um, amphitheater, in the beautiful atrium of the museum. I thought because we are showing work from the Center for the Less Good Idea, it would be good to talk about the center itself and what it means, but I'm mainly going to be talking about the next project that I'm thinking about, and this is using this lecture as an occasion to think aloud. It's a project that begins next January, and uh, there are some ideas, and those I'll be talking through, but it'll largely be in connection to different projects which have emerged from the Center for the Less Good Idea. It's not quite sure how it will be positioned, but the center is a very 
central component of the project. The project is called tentatively at this stage, the great yes and the great no. But first to talk a little bit about the, the center itself. The center is an art center, a physical art center in Johannesburg that was founded uh, six years ago by Bronwyn Lace, who's here, and myself, and is now run in Johannesburg by Pala Okudice Pala, who should be here but can't because he's not been given a passport through the bureaucracy in South Africa. So he stays back in Johannesburg, where the heart of the center always is. The name of the center, the Center for the Less Good Idea, I hope not the least good idea, but just the less good idea, <laughs> comes from a Tswana proverb, an African proverb, and the translation of the proverb roughly would be, if the good doctor can't cure you, find the less good doctor. <laughs> In other words, when the grand ideas fail you, look for ideas that are more marginal at the sides, at the periphery that can come in and shape what it is that you are, what you are making. This both has uh, immediate implications for a way of thinking about making a work of art, which is what I'll be talking about today, about a performance, um, about saying it's not enough to rely on your first good idea. Everybody starts with an idea. You can't start nowhere. You start with an idea, an impulse. But very often in the activity of following that idea through, whether it's in a drawing or in a rehearsal or in a studio, a dance studio, a music studio, cracks start appearing in the, that first grand idea which seemed so perfect when you thought of it at four in the morning. And there are two solutions. The one, either you bandage it up and you bring an army of authoritarian certainty to defend that grand idea, or you can say, accept those cracks and what can come out of those cracks? What are things you glimpsed at the edge of an improvisation that can find its way to actually shape the heart of what you are thinking about? And that's the basis of the less good idea, of the center for the less good idea. It's a space for actors, dancers, choreographers, videographers, writers, visual artists to come together and discover the energy that comes from working together and being open to what emerges. So it would say that it, it privileges over rational understanding the category of recognition. When you see something and suddenly it heats you up, you feel an aliveness in what it presents to you and says, this is something to follow. We may not know quite what it means, but let's follow it. It's a bit analogous to the psychoanalytic process where it's not so much that you have to know everything if you're the analyst or the patient, but you say, let's work in an open-ended way, allow free association to have the space give the word or the image, in our case, the benefit of the doubt, and see what comes out of that. Trust in the work, trust in the image, trust in the impulse, that it will know more than yourself. As a poet once said, uh, if the poet is more intelligent than the poem, then he shouldn't be writing poetry. <laughs> you, need to, you need a certain degree of stupidity to be acting in the studio, to be performing in the studio, to be open to what you yourself don't know that you know. And that's the way the center works. We've had nine seasons of different projects. The three pieces we're presenting here are three out of, I think, 300 different performances that have happened in the last um, six years. There have been 700 different actors and performers that have come through the center. So it's a taste of the kind of things that are done at the center and by no means even a representative look at what we've done. Um, so that's, that's a bit about the, the center. We have seasons, sometimes two a year, nowadays one a year, in which different curators invite different performers to make different works, which then get presented to the public as they are being presented here in our informal space in Johannesburg. It's not a theater, sometimes it gets turned into an end-on theater, sometimes it's a dance space. Uh, its physical form shifts and moves between different, different rooms. Um, but to talk about the project that I'm interested in, and it's a project that comes very much out of 
recognizing things in different seasons and different performances at the center and being intrigued by what they suggest and allowing that to lead the idea. There is a, there is a, a grand idea, there's a starting point, it can't start with nothing, and there are different ones. The one might be uh, Brecht, the person who asked Brecht and uh, Bertolt Brecht and said, and in the bad times, will there be poetry? And he said, yes, in the bad times there will be poetry. There will be poetry about the bad times. And I suppose this, this means that in a sense I am feeling that we are all in a difficult situation. I'm taking it from South Africa, our current difficult uh, position uh, politically, socially, economically. We're definitely going through very dark and difficult times. But not only in South Africa. In many ways, South Africa seems a kind of premonition of what happens in the rest of the world. So we have an economy that will never be able to employ everyone in the country. So we have to come to terms with an informal economy and a formal economy and understanding how the informal economy always subsidizes the formal economy and what that means for how people will live their lives. So the Brecht statement is one. Another is from the play by Buchner in which uh, Wozzeck says, uh, us poor people, if we ever get to heaven, we'd have to help make the thunder even there, as, the, as another one. And Mayakovsky, the great Russian and Soviet poet, whose work is the starting point in the presentations at the theater, who writes in his uh, tragedy called Mayakovsky, a tragedy that the world is leaking. How do we stop the world leaking? How do we stick a finger into the world? So the great thing about Mayakovsky is he takes a simple image and makes it an image of a city, or makes a city into a character, or can turn the whole world into a character. So these are impulses that are sitting behind me. I know I want a piece of theater. I know we have many actors, performers, musicians that I want to bring into it. But how did these ideas start to coalesce? And they will have a physical form in a workshop we will have in January with many of the actors and performers from the center and from elsewhere coming together. And the talk I'm giving you now is kind of how we'll start the project with, with them. This is in the hope that this evening some new ideas will emerge that give me some <laughs> sense of what it is to be where we will be, where we will be going. Another, another starting point, these are just phrases which sit in my head as root markers, is a line from the great poet Ossip Mandelstam in his poem about Stalin, where he says, uh, every time someone is murdered, he sticks his chest out for another medal. And this connects to uh, another image I had in my head, and I'm talking about, this really is a talk in which ideas are jumping around backwards and forwards, trying to track the way ideas actually float and coalesce. And this is a story about the coronation of Queen Elizabeth in 1953. At, the, at her coronation, all obviously the heads of colonial countries and different territories under her dominion were invited to the, to the coronation and everybody came in their finest, you know, finest uniforms and crowns and all. And so everybody wore massive bands and brocades and epaulettes and medals, all the different, many, many rows of medals, as one is familiar. All except one king from one of the African countries who just came in a lounge suit. But he had behind him a young man walking behind who was wearing all his medals and all his brocades <laughs> and everything behind. So that image of what it is for death to be walking along and behind him coming all the trophies of who he has collected becomes an, an image in my head. And I think, okay, maybe there's a character of, the character of death is one of the figures that go through it, but a kind of a depressed death who can only pick at his food and sits at the edge of the stage, but maybe becomes a narrator at different points. But what I'm going to show you, and we are going to go through five or six different video fragments, are different fragments that have, of pieces that we've done at the center which have given rise to specific ideas and languages to think about in this as yet completely unstructured, unformed 
performance that may emerge. So let us begin. So the first piece is a short extract. We can keep this light on, keep this light on the whole time, because I'll talk over some of them. <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah, we're not showing complete films. It's fine that the image is not so clear. This is an extract from uh, Mayakovsky, A Tragedy, uh, one of the pieces that's on, that is performed uh, at the theatre down the road. So for those of you who haven't seen it, to give you an idea of it, and then I'll talk about what's interesting for me in it. From the heavens, a god gone mad is looking down on the hallowing human horde, his hand tattered in his beard, eaten thin by the dust of the roads. He is God. without food like I've gone without food. You would chew on the distant expenses of the East and West. If you've loved like I have loved, you would murder love. Okay, that gives you a sense of the, of the language. That's a particular piece using a 19th century uh, theatrical technique called the Pepper's Ghost. And I'm not interested in doing a Pepper's Ghost in the new piece, but I'm interested in the paper puppets in the way that they work and also in the, the text of Mayakovsky. There's something about the way that Mayakovsky writing in the 1920s was able to turn a city into a character or a street, to animate a street as a figure, to turn the whole world into a possible character on stage rather than an abstract idea. So that comes from the Mayakovsky, many particular lines from the Mayakovsky, I'm sure will be notes to myself as we, as we go. And what that also suggests from the, from the, um, let me find a moment here. From the kind of the paper animated puppet that you see here is one of the languages to think of deconstructing figures. And this project, in fact, was the starting point for the second piece I want to talk about, which was a, a film made for a Shostakovich symphony. After the invitation came, said, would I make a film for a live performance of a Shostakovich symphony? I thought of this piece that I'd made and thought, yes, between Mayakovsky and these paper cutout puppets, one could maybe work with, work with something. So there's the start of a visual language, which in this case moves from this performance into the Shostakovich one. So what we're gathering at the moment is not so much a clear idea of narrative or of even of the arc of the piece, but rather uh, some of the languages of making it and from that some idea. So if you look at this puppet at the side, it's very much about something that fragments and comes together and fragments and comes together. And that for me, I suppose, has an echo of uh, the great yes and the great no and the great yes and the great no. Uh, the Great Yes and the Great No is a, is a line from a Kavafi poem, I think, and it's about a love affair. It's not about the state of the world at all, but there's something of its open-endedness and the ambition of it. It's not a little yes, a little no. It's a great yes, a great no, that makes me think it can expand and become the basis for a kind of anarchic thinking about many things in, in the world. So the Shostakovich project, which was a film, used the idea of, we started off just thinking I would use paper puppets and animate paper puppets, and then started making puppets with the costume designer that I worked with. This was during COVID, so she was working in Belgium, I was working in Johannesburg, and we'd send photos and sketches and collages to each other. 
and then had the idea, in addition to working with the puppets, we could take some of the puppets and actually enlarge them into human-sized costumes and see how that worked with costumes. And for the Shostakovich, I wanted a series of, of specific characters. Of uh, The symphony is very much one first performed just after the death of Stalin. So I wanted it to be a way of looking back at the history of the Soviet Union and of artists in the Soviet Union. This was long before the war in Ukraine, which gives it a slightly different uh, slant. And the way of doing that was the way thinking of these paper puppets with flat cut out heads of characters. And I'll show you now an extract from that film so you'll see how the language shifts from that into the Shostakovich, but while working on the Shostakovich, which is a film, it's only for projection, it seemed such a waste to have those performers and those heads only filmed. So the idea became, well, what would it be if they're live on stage? So that, I suppose, was the starting point of what was undo if one has this language of flat cutout heads, of paper costumes, something that's both specific, you can recognize the characters, but it's not naturalistic, it's anti-naturalistic, but not abstract. Where would that allow us to, to go? So I'll show now an extract from the Shostakovich project and then talk about the different associations that gave rise to. So this is maybe three or four minutes of the making and from the project. I just pause for a moment there. That uh, puppet, that beautiful small puppet, then became the basis for making a full-size costume to put, in fact, the same person who's manipulating it, uh, Tulani Chauke, into the costume to perform. He's a fantastic dancer and very central to this project and to the project which may emerge. Circular letters, authorizations, copies, theses, second copies, corrections, excerpts, references, card files, resolutions, reports, minutes of proceedings, other certifying documents. See what I mean? Things must be destroyed. Smash purgatory to smithereens. Thrust iron into the living. The massacre's over, gaiety ahead.
it's, it's a speech is and it's like a politician. The important thing is that this doesn't come in front of your face and this doesn't come in front of your face to the audience here. And it's holding positions leaning forward, okay? You can mark it, run it. And Okay, so that was the fragment of the Shostakovich symphony. So there are... <laughs> so that's a 55-minute film, the length, of the, the length of the symphony, and this is a few fragments from it, but there were many things that, as you can imagine, that came out of there that were curtailed or shaped very tightly by the demands of the symphony, but which are kind of begging to be expanded and to be let further. So the first obvious one is that this is simply restricted to the three Soviet politicians and Mayakovsky and Shostakovich and Lily Brick and one or two others. But if one used the same technique of those flat heads for a whole range of other politic, you know, politicians, individuals, a whole way of working with the crowd, it's, you know, if you double the face, if you do print the same face twice, suddenly you've either got twins, so you can do all the games of French farce of twins, um, you can play with uh, the dead and the undead, what it is to be dying and watching yourself dying. The same person is there in both places. So the multiplication becomes one of the themes and one of the possibilities. There's the question of the swapping of heads, taking one head to another, which suddenly, which is the man, which is the woman within that. So there's a kind of fluidity of identity that is possible simply by picking up one head or another head and playing with them. Those are one of the things we'll be testing in the, in the workshop. So for the workshop, we won't just have those uh, particular heads. We'll cut out and draw a whole lot more, more heads to do it. So one can say, right, if one says, let's expand the world from the Soviet Union, then does one, uh, who are the characters one then brings in? Um, I mean, is there Mao who has to stand in for China? Is there Churchill's face who stands for Europe, or Kennedy for the United States, or do we just keep Lenin, or do we keep Jomo Kenyatta for uh, the Third World, or Nehru and Gandhi? And then I think, okay, but that's a very male-based set of political figures. So can Rosa Luxemburg stand in for the whole of Eastern Europe, and uh, Queen Victoria for the idea of Europe, and Madame Mao for for that part of the world, and Indira Gandhi rather than Gandhi. Although, of course, the recognition also says, which faces will people recognize uh, easily? But maybe there's a question, no, maybe they have to learn to recognize other faces and not just the same old, same old. So this is, a, this is a, one of the kind of questions that will be there in the workshop. And it's both a theoretical question, but it gets tested practically. In other words, we'll have many different heads and see what they are. What does it look like? What is it? What is it, which parts feel interesting and which feel uninteresting? For me, it's very interesting when the male dancer who in fact performs the female role in this piece takes a male mask and they swap. And you can't at a certain point work out who's the performer, who is the character. So that's one element of a, a new theme to develop further. The second is kind of the unblinking look, those eyes that never blink looking at you, which is a kind of the unblinking look of history looking back, us having to take responsibility for where, we have, for where we have got to. That's another kind of theme that is suggested by the, by the material. Here we could work, as you could see, with a small cardboard model, not to turn into a large theatrical set, but to simply push an iPhone or a GoPro camera through it and make it enormous, the size. So do we work with, if we have the character 
who now turns from death into a kind of godlike character, if he's busy with a small model at the front of the stage, and you see it as a projection enormous in front of which the actors perform, then does he manipulate them? Or just, so that becomes a different question about scale and manipulation. So we'll test, what is it? And then it becomes a series of practical questions. Do we literally have the actors in front of green screen performing and the model of the set and then a computer off stage that mixes the two together? And knowing the complication of that, I say, no, 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 I'm sure we film that and work out what we want on the screen and then it's performed as if it is being done as live projection. Um, but that's a practical question. But it's a practical question and a lot of the a lot of the theoretical or even ethical questions dissolve into the in the side of the studio into a series of practical questions. In the same way you can take a roll of film and you turn this abstract idea of time into something very concrete, into the frames of a film, into the weight, 800 grams for four minutes of film. You turn things that are abstract and invisible into something very concrete. And that's what happens in the studio by the nature of its studio. So the world comes in, it gets fragmented and turned into these very series of questions for which the questions of emotion, of psychology, go off to the, to the edges and wait in the edges. And then you see when you've taken your fragments and you reconstruct them and send that back out into the world as a drawing or a film as a performance, where it reconnects to the broader questions of the world, to questions of psychology, of ethics, all of those things. It's trusting, in, and that's the heart of the center also, trusting that in the end the process is going to show you both how the work should be, but also who you are. And if in the end the world is the work you've made when it comes out is pretentious or portentous, then that tells you something about yourself. If it's too modest, it tells you something about that. If it's overly ambitious and falls apart at the edges, it's a lesson about yourself as well as about the work. Which, so this is the big question that the center takes on. Is this a realistic way to work? You know, we've been working at it for six years, testing things out this way, and some of them are very beautiful results and some of them are not such beautiful results. But it's still an open-ended question. It may well be in the end say, no, no, for God's sake, write the script. There's a good reason why people write a script before they make a film or they have a text before they make a play. They've known for 2,000 years that's the way you have to do it. You know, hidden in the history are all the improvisations that just were great but then disappeared. So it's, it's an open-ended question, but it's one that we're happy to take on at the center and in this in this project, but to talk more about specific things in the Shostakovich that I want to look at. So I'll show you the, one of the key things for me is, this is one kind of the moments when improvisation suddenly grab you and you can feel it in your taste buds, in your armpits, you can feel an excitement in it. And this had to do with me reading out odd lines of Mayakovsky to Tulani, who is behind the dress and the mask and saying, find a gesture that accompanies each phrase, like these ones. Reports, minutes of proceedings, other certifying documents. See what I mean, things must be destroyed. Smash purgatory to smithereens. Thrust up. OK, so there's something about the specific nature of what he produced in those, the sharpness of them, the flatness of the face, the sharpness of the action which seemed to me this is a really interesting thing to work with initially with him, but also with other people, to go through a number of phrases, a number of, you know, of ideas or phrases, always a phrase, and record what these gestures were. And then almost write a script, a physically, physical movement script, a choreography based on these particular movements. So I know that I'll have a day of filming with Tulani to find these gestures. And then every day in the workshop, we'll spend half an hour learning them and seeing what they become as a kind of choreography or a language. It's a kind of sign language of the whole body. Not that you have to understand what each one means, but they have the specificity of the performer knowing what he is saying. And that's, that's interesting. That's a bit like, uh, like 
both the words of a song, where if you hear a song in a different language, it's not so vital that you don't understand those words, but it's vital that you have a sense that the singer knows what he's doing. Or a bit like uh, in, in the Jewish world, uh, praying in shul, where you, you have, or I had no idea, the words that are mumbled at a million miles an hour of the Hebrew, but you think it's okay, God understands them, I don't have to understand <laughs> each, of those, each of those words. But this, this, this choreography of this mixture of costume, head, and gesture is something that we're at the beginning of exploring. It suggests that the piece becomes a very musical and physical piece rather than a textual piece as a central, as a central question. And then that has the question, if you're working this way, will it just be a nice abstract dance piece? Can you actually get it to still engage with any of the, with any of the questions? I'll show you the next fragment, which is... We also have here from this very clearly the idea of chorus. So we have... Oh, sorry. Just leaning forward, okay. You can mark it. Run. So here we have a possible chorus. And it's possible simply by just changing the heads to have many different choruses, a chorus of women, a chorus of men, a chorus of the rich, a chorus of the, of the poor, of the north and the south. Um, so it gives the flexibility with a cast of 10 or 12, we can make many different, many different worlds. Uh, so that's another important part of the, of the things we saw in that project. This is an extract from a project done at the center last year, which we in fact perform next week in, uh, in Los Angeles at the Red Cat Theater. So at the season here, we have the writers of Kafka, um, Conrad, and Mayakovsky. And this is a text, a long text by a Cameroonian writer, Ferdinand Oyono. And this is, again, a short extract from that production, but again, to talk about the language which emerged from it. My name is Tundi Ondoa. My name is Tundi Ondoa. I am the son of Tundi and Zama. When the father baptized me, he gave me the name of Joseph. On the day before initiation, I found him in the middle of his dinner. We continued the conversation by signs. I knew I had been accepted. That is how I became Father Gilbert's boy. So be you go via. The boy back to you. Sophie, you can come. The little pure. Sophie, go to my father and madame the mother. Sophie, Sophie when, when you see me with the white lady. Sophie, look at me. We are brothers. We are brothers. Sophie, why did you not see me? Sophie, you can come. A commandant's wife arrives in the wounded. There was no attention now except for Madame. Ali Gaba, Ali Gaba, Ali 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 Gaba, Ali Gaba, Ali Gaba, Ali 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 a hundred and fifty thousand friends. I see. Do you know the person involved? Yes, sir. A tricolor fluttered over the roof. This was the police station. Okay, so this was this was a way of looking at a whole novel. It's a two-hour performance the slight reduction of the length of the full novel, a wonderful colonial novel by Ferdinand Oyono. 
But what from that, what I'm interested in is the idea of a narrator. Two things. One is the narrator, which may be the figure of death again, I'm not sure, um, in which he fills in all the... It takes the convention of, of, uh, of theater in which two actors would be talking to each other, in which you can see who's talking, so there's no need to say he said, she said, but to put it back into the literature where, I'm sorry, said the commandant's wife. Why are you sorry? To have that shift backwards and forwards. And also to play all the performances straight out to the audience rather than towards each other. So you're both seeing a performance and listening to a novel being read. And there's something about the performances that are flat on which suggests something that could work with the paper cutout heads that we have, but also with the possibility of removing them and talking and then being back in it. With also the idea of frozen moments that go together with the narration being spoken. So for a long time I was looking for a specific novel to say this will be the next novel which we will take all these things into. Um, but both haven't found it but also realized no, then I'm going to be struggling to fit into it all the other languages that we are finding. And in a way the test of this is to say can one take real questions in the world or real subjects but allow the starting to be these four or five different ways of working with, with language. And I mean, and the questions are, you know, they're, they're, they're large and they're generalized, but the hope will be to make them much more specific. Questions of the formal and informal economy, of the northern hemisphere versus the southern, the southern of wealth and poverty, um, of all of those, you know, which we know are fundamental questions, questions of gender, questions of violence to the uh, environment. There are so many, I'm sure not all of them will come in, but they will be kind of there. And one of, one of the characters that was in the, I think it's in this next section, let's go to the next extract. Oh, okay, different one, but we can see here. So this piece came from one of our seasons. At the end of many of the seasons, we have what we call the surplus circus, which is to say fragments which have emerged during the workshops and improvisations, which aren't really coherent in themselves, but which are interesting as possible directions. And we had a season in which we had a lot of piano playing. We had a mixture of a jazz pianist playing and a classical pianist. So we had an evening which was half a... Um, a classical sonata and then a, half the evening was a jazz improvisation and then smashed the two together to play against each other and through. And the improvisation that you've just seen there was two of the performers with megaphones that were lying around playing against that Schubert uh, sonata. It was obviously, as you can see, a pre-COVID improvisation. <laughs> um, but there's, there's something about the desperation to be heard and not being heard by the pianist which without writing anything in grand text suddenly becomes very much about a northern hemisphere sensibility that will not hear what is happening somewhere else. So to, I know that that's an image I want to show and to play with and to see how it can expand or not. I mean, there'll be more ideas than we can use in the piece and some will get abandoned 
and some will grow and become um, other things. But that the desperation that the two men had blowing at each other and shouting at each other in those sealed off megaphones um, seems to hold in itself a lot of the thematic work that I'm interested in the, in the piece. And it also brings the question then of what is the music we will have in the, in the piece. I know that we will have choruses, so we will need choral music. I'm interested in uh, something that comes very much from the Western canon, like that uh, Schubert sonata, so I'm sure we'll have a pianist and maybe a cellist as well, or maybe a third instrument. It depends how the composer finally wants to shape uh, all of those elements. There's a wonderful sonata by a Russian uh, composer, Ustvolskaya, which is really thumping of the piano at enormous volume and strength. I don't know how pianos survive. And it's a duet between that and someone hitting a steel bar with hammers. And it's, uh, it's kind of deafening, but it's kind of wonderfully powerful. And it's not just chaos. It's a chaos from which, from which a real order emerges. So I know that's one of the pieces we'll, we'll play with and I'll ask the pianist and the percussionist to, to do for us. There's also something of the, of the megaphones, the two megaphones the men had there. And <coughs> a thought is maybe we have a chorus of megaphones. So you've got both a chorus of these heads, but you can also just have 12 megaphones on stands that are singing out to the to the audience. And there have been megaphones that have come through my work in a lot of different ways. Um, here are some of them, just which some as sculpture, some as used in performance. And I don't think we're going to use anything the way they are used here, but I'm, I'm interested also in thinking, what is this if it's a theater performance, but also a kind of an installation that could be in a museum or a gallery? Do we have a room of projections? Do we have a room of these megaphones performing? We've always, whenever we've done a big project and talked about this kind of thing, we've always wanted to have a room of failures. All the things we've tried, but didn't work. And then whenever we've talked about it, that's been the room that everybody wants to work on. <laughs> and then we fail at it. But this time I'm determined we're going to have a room of failures as well. So it's, the workshop will be open-ended to know we're working on a theater piece, but let's keep in mind what other possible things can come out of it. So these are different megaphones which are part of the thinking for the, for the piece. More that way always, more that way. That's it. And then back to it, and then Sue, you can look at it. Look at the megaphone. <coughs> look at the megaphone, Sue. And then back to your typing. The megaphone's talking the whole time. Look more towards me, megaphone. That's good. And Sue, straighten your skirt. And megaphone, look at her. And start again. So this was a piece, we'll, we'll keep going. This was a piece that was made for um, Biennale in Istanbul. And the point of connection I found to myself in Istanbul was that is where Trotsky was in exile when he was thrown out of the Soviet Union. He was in exile on an island, uh, Buyukuda Island, just off the coast from Istanbul. And so the piece I made had to do with Trotsky in exile, and it was about the love affair of the megaphone for Trotsky's secretary. <laughs> so the work here is the preliminary work and fragments of the piece that were made.
au combat résolu près pour la révolution. Mais les dictations révolutionnaires exigent un régime de démocratie intérieure. La discipline révolutionnaire n'a rien à faire avec l'obéissance aveugle. La combativité ne peut être préparée par avance. You have been swindled. Heaven is talking in a foreign tongue. The radio is faithful to the megahertz. The machine doesn't tire. The machine doesn't drink to excess. The machine will never toy toy or dance the Charleston. Machine says, beware of the age of 73. Tomorrow will be cloudy with intermittent sunshine. There will be one happy man in northeastern Brazil. Machine says. Okay. So that gives an idea of some of the... It was thinking about megaphones, but when I saw it, the thing that strikes me is that sense of the flood covering the world, the water rising and rising and rising, uh, which presumably we will do with projection and not with water on, on stage. But it does give uh, an idea of the world as leaking as the flood, as the condition that we're in of instability, things that were stable, we now know glaciers aren't stable, polar ice caps aren't stable. They're, there's a way in which our climate crisis is also a metaphor for all these social crises that we have at the same time and vice versa. It doesn't really help to make one prior and the other secondary. They both are the world we're living in. So that becomes another possible direction that it, it goes on. I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to zoom through the next ones. Um, the only thing I really want to point out in the next one is the character of the world as a, the figure of the world as a character. This is the piece that was shown here in this museum a few years ago. And in it, it's mainly actors moving, but there's some paper animation. And that gave the idea of, can the world itself be a character? So whether the world is a paper cutout or whether it's a costume that someone wears in a big inflated thing or whether it is a miniature that the figure of death holds in his hands but which we see projected as a huge scale, it becomes one of the, one of the possible languages. And of course that can be fragmented as it is there or fragmented more. We can zoom in on those fragments to find different parts of the world we want to look at, different stories of them. I mean, you can see here, many images get recycled from one project into another. Performers, actors, things that we're interested in. And the last piece I'm going to show for me is, in a way, the key starting point for the project. If one has to find where is the emotional weight of a piece. This was a piece made at the center. I made the authors of it, really the women in it. And it's a piece about, it's a chorus of women, and in this case it's a chorus of women who were the widows of miners who were killed 
by the police while on strike at a uh, platinum mine outside Johannesburg some 10 or 12 years ago. Um, and it's a very moving piece of theatre. They're just short of a musical piece. And it seemed to me that that would be a key element. That's why when I think of the choruses, that becomes a key part of the musical language of the, uh, and of the political language of the piece. Um, So it's a question of how do we integrate the chorus of women. But for me, it also has a possible connection if we start with a sense of a world fragmented. Who are the people who always have to come and pick up the mess? Who are the ones who glean the remnants at the end of a battlefield like Mother Courage? Who are the ones here, the widows who are left after their men are killed? So this piece called Untandazo is a very key part in my head, and I'll be working with some of the singers and musicians from this in the workshop, I hope, and seeing where that goes, whether this is the beginning of their, pres their presence as chorus that expands through the whole piece and quite how that works. So this is what I will end with. I'm not sure if we're running too late for questions afterwards, but uh, I'll be told. I think it's about three, two or three minutes long.
Good. Thank you. 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 I've been, I've been told that we have time for a few questions. I'm not sure if the cast has to leave to get ready for the performance. So if they need to leave now, uh, Carol will, and Bronwyn will say if they need to. But they all go, yeah. Cast follow Dimikatso, and we'll see you in the theater a bit later. Then I can just sit and watch. Um, Okay, you kind of know as much about the project as I do now, so. <laughs> but I'm happy to answer. Yes, there's a question. What's uh, 24 hours in a day of William Kendrick's life? <laughs> William Kendrick's life. Yes. Each one okay, what, what is 24 hours in my, in the day? Pick any day. Pick any day. Well, there's a big difference. I mean, there's, the fundamental difference are days when I'm not in the studio, such as when I'm out of the country like this with either exhibitions or performances and when I'm in the studio. So let's talk about a studio day rather than a... I'm not one of the artists who draws wherever they are. When I'm in the studio, I'm drawing. When I'm on the road, I'm reading and making notes, but not, not drawing. It used to be very easy. It used to be I'd make breakfast for my children and my wife sort of at eight and they'd go off to school, but since they've left the house, it's, I mean, since they're adults and left, um, it's still usually sort of breakfast with Anne, my wife, at about eight. And people come in, the team comes into the studio at about nine. And the team is there, there are, when it's drawing, it doesn't help to have anyone else there. The drawing I need to do, and the actual animation. But there are editors who work in an edit room upstairs, particularly with things like the Shostakovich project. There was a team of four editors working for six months or eight months on that. And there's a, a whole team in the office next to the studio doing logistics, photo research, um, keeping everything in order in the studio. But it would very often consist of a movement between the drawing studio and going upstairs to the, see what's happening in the edit room. There's a studio in the garden of my house, and there's a larger, rougher studio downtown where sculpture is made, and if we're doing big rehearsals, we would rehearse there, and that's adjacent to the Center for the Less Good Idea. So sometimes it's moving backwards and forwards between the, the two studios. We have the principle that whoever is in the studio uh, at lunchtime, we all have lunch together. So there's a big studio lunch of between 10 and 18 people, depending who's working there in the garden, if it's nice weather, otherwise in the, in the house. Recently, one of the uh, people in the studio, Damon, has decided that every Thursday at five o'clock we'll have cocktails. And he makes the most fantastic cocktails and is gradually educating the palates of all of us of the range of different cocktails. We have one big studio lunch of everybody who's worked in the studio, about 80 people once a year. Um, but very often it's sort of in the evening when everybody's gone that it's quiet time for me to do drawing or to start a drawing. Once a drawing's begun, I can continue when I know other people are working in the other room. There's quite often music put on so that I don't have to listen to the phone conversations in the office and things like that around. So it's not a good listening to music. It's music as something that's heard and then not heard. But it's kind of like the default position is to be in the studio if it's a choice. It's like such a pleasure. Gym or studio? The gym doesn't get a look in. <laughs> And to an extent, kitchen or studio, I like cooking, but if it's a choice, it's more often in the studio. Yes? Can you talk about your time in Milwaukee so far? And, and here? As an expert, yes, I've been here for like 18 hours. I'm an expert on the... Uh, well, there are. There, firstly, I want to thank John for the beautiful exhibition at your Museum. It really was a pleasure to see a lot of the old work I'd forgotten and to see it in that context. So that was a, and the other is the extraordinary collection in this museum. I mean, it really is uh, fantastic things to, 
to see. If it was slightly smaller and my jacket was slightly bigger, I'd have taken the Gustin with me out <laughs> through the door. But there are many, many treasures, uh, treasures here. Um, it's the first place I've ever been where they put cheese and a lobster into your Bloody Mary. <laughs> I must confess, I think it is a mistake. I think it is misguided. <laughs> Yes. Since so much of your work is video, is there a way for people that are several thousand miles away to get tastes There are there are tastes. It's a it's a kind of a it's complex to know how best to show it. There's a million fragments on uh, and sometimes complete films on YouTube. Um, it's, it's best to see it in an exhibition context, which is the way I prefer it to be seen, where the projection conditions are right or the context is, um, is given. I mean, I worked very hard to get people to see the animation and the films as part of the language of the fine arts world and not as something just as a film to be seen on YouTube. So it was probably less available on YouTube than many people would, would like, but I think it does get seen. A lot of people have seen them in different forms over the over the years. Yes. Can you speak about your experience in the Yes, yes. I mean, I'm, we could have, there are many lectures we could have done here, but um, to talk about the, and in this one I thought I would talk about the less good idea and how it suggests many new things. Um, the heart of what I do is always drawing. So even in this, what I haven't spoken at all about is what would the projection be that goes with it, whether it's cardboard models or charcoal animation, all of that's still another language to think about in, in that. Um, you know, it, it almost all starts as drawing, and sometimes the drawing gets filmed and it becomes an animated film, and sometimes the film is used with a piece of theater, then it becomes a kind of a film in, in four dimensions. But the principles are those of drawing, and the center for the less good idea is predicated on the idea of drawing, where a drawing is the thinking process. I mean, if you do a sketch for a drawing, then that sketch is the drawing we're talking about, where you have an impulse, but the activity of making the drawing is discovering what the drawing finally is. And to try to think about performance in the same way, which is not the normal way of thinking about performance but to have that uh, openness of where it's going to go. Uh, feels like a kind of craftsmanship. Yes? Uh, since you're doing a cinematic manager, have you looked at your artists? Uh, you talk about your work being different from various other artists. Uh, and also, your ambitions and your ambitions uh, Yes, I mean, the concert is next week is written, the music is written by Philip Miller. Um, for whom, you know, with whom I've worked over 25 years. And it's the ongoing question for both of us when working it is how does what you hear change what you see and what you see what you hear? In other words, there's some pieces of music which make the animation so jerky you can't really bear to watch it, and others where the same piece of animation suddenly feels it has an energy and a movement. And um, so that's an ongoing. Uh, it's an ongoing, not, not experiment, it's an ongoing discovery and work with him. Um, I found, for example, working with Schubert's Winterreiser, a series of 24 songs for which there were 24 films, there was something in the left hand of the piano music that gives you the rhythm of the person walking on his winter journey that somehow became like a big wheel that turned the films along as you followed it. Uh, as you went. So there's something sometimes about needing something that will drive the films along, particularly the animations which are very fragmented and not so clear narratively, that actually changes your understanding. Um, I've worked with Shostakovich a lot, obviously, both in animated films and in the opera, The Nose, and in the symphony here. There's something about his connection to film from when he used to play the piano with silent films that makes it music very, very conducive. It's music that needs to be looked at. Um, 
the other operas, the Mozart and the uh, Berg operas, Lulu and Wozzeck, I've only done a few operas. I've done maybe five operas. I do one every four or five years, not five a year. So it's a very different thing to being an opera director. And they take a long time. And there always has to be something in the opera in its theme that is wider than the specific libretto. That's and then it's also vital to find a language in which to think about or a medium in which to think about that theme, whether it's charcoal animation for Wozzeck or uh, torn up ink drawings for Lulu. They become a language in which the broader themes kind of uh, emerge. Um, you know, an opera, is, an opera is both a fantastic opportunity, an opera house gives you this canvas 17 meters wide, 8 meters high, 10 meters deep. They throw in one of the great orchestras in the world. They'll give you as a bonus 15 of the best singers you can find anywhere and a conductor to keep them all in order. So in that sense, you can think of directing an opera as being given this chance to make this three-hour drawing, which is uh, in Fantastic. You can also think of it as being you're the hired help who's there to direct it. It's their production. They're doing it. You just tell the singers where to go at which point. But I prefer to think of it in the first way to do it. Yes. Yes. I think the megaphones emerged. Obviously, they have associations with, you know. With Broadcasting with enlarging voices, with propaganda, all the different associations of that big megaphone. But they really came into the work as a response to Cezanne. Cezanne took the world and then he said, we can take the whole world and we can divide it up and reduce it to the, uh, the cylinder, the sphere, and the cone. And I said, well, what if you take these objects of Cezanne, these pure formal objects, and send them back out into the world to earn their keep? So Cezanne's, uh, Cezanne's uh, cone is sent back out into the world as a megaphone. And it's always, I see that as its geometric shape, but that is also active in the world. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>